Thanks for coming to our Android Things talk. My name is Geeta Krishna. I manage the core enabling team at, of uh, Android Things at Intel. Uh, my team has been working closely with Google to provide uh, board support packages for some of the IA-based uh, developer boards. My co-speaker is Anisha Kulkarni. She's an experienced developer for Android and is leading the bootloader component of Android Things in the team right now. We also have a talk later at 11 a.m. in the same room by Senrio, who would be diving into the peripheral manager and providing more details for you on that. So be sure to attend that as well. Uh, the outline of the session today is we will provide you with what Android Things is, its deployment model, uh, get into the technical details of the architecture, uh, walk you through getting started on a developer board, uh, provide code samples, uh, online resources, and then take questions in the end. So Android Things is the new OS from Google. It's based on Android and targeted for the Internet of Things market. Uh, for those of you familiar with Brillo, how many people are familiar with Brillo here? Quite a few. So it's a successor to Brillo and is a rebranded version of Brillo. The main difference between Android Things and Brillo is that Android Things brings back into the stack the Android APIs and the Android runtime plus Android Studio, which was missing in Brillo. Uh, another key difference is that the deployment model is very different from what Brillo was. So in essence, Android Things is Android without system apps and the content providers. In addition, it adds functionality, which is necessary for the IoT development. The, the key functionality is Peripheral Manager, which allows uh, for apps to interact with the sensors and actuators through APIs and uh, uh, industry standard protocols like GPI and I2C. A developer's console, which helps register the device and control it. Metrics and analytics for uh, monitoring and maintaining the health of your fleet of devices. Weave, which is an open, secure communication protocol between the device and the cloud. Six low pan and threads, uh, low power uh, network protocols. It also supports AV style OTA updates, which allows for the update to happen on an alternate partition and uh, features um, a rollback on failure and also less downtime on an update. As uh, Android Things loses a lot of the baggage that comes with the apps, the memory footprint is much lesser than what would be for Android. It can run in about 500 megabyte or less than 500 megabyte, as opposed to Android, which requires almost two to three gigabytes. As I mentioned, it's a fairly new OS. The first developer's preview was released two months back in December, uh, which featured basic OS functionality and support for four developer boards. Uh, the second developer's preview was released just two weeks back on February 9th. It added two more developer boards to it and had some bug fixes and uh, support for USB audio, code sample for TensorFlow, and pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, Google is uh, uh, committed to uh, providing developers preview every six to eight weeks. And you can participate by downloading the image and uh, playing with it, filing bug reports. You can also provide feature requests. There's discussion forums, both in st uh, Stack Overflow and the Google Plus forums. So as you can see, there's a, quite a few key features that's still missing from Android things and will be in future releases. One of them is Weave, which is uh, the communication protocol between the device and the cloud. So it's, Weave is a secure open communication protocol from Google. It provides for an IoT developer console, which you can use to register the device with the Weave server provides bi-directional device to cloud communication. Uh, also, once connected, the device can leverage all of the Google services like Google Assistant and uh, state storage in the cloud. 
Another thing that we tries to address is the issue of device interoperability. So it provides uh, uh, commonly used schemas for devices, which the device manufacturers can uh, base the device on so that devices can talk to each other. For those of you familiar with Brillo, you would uh, remember that V was an integral part of the OS. For Android things, it has been decoupled and will be installed as an APK. So it will have its own release cycle, which may or may not match with that of Android things. If you attended Imad's keynote on Tuesday, he talked about OCF and IoTivity. OCF publishes open IoT standards, and IoTivity implements the standards. So there's nothing stopping you from using IoTivity with Android things, even though Weave is the preferred protocol. Um, in fact, if you go to the Intel showcase upstairs, there's a demo there running uh, Edison-based jukebox which, based on Android things and being controlled by IoTivity. So Gartner projects that there will be about 200 billion IoT devices by the year 2020, which is 30 times more than what we have today. However, IoT development is fairly challenging right now, not, not in its maturity at all. There's complex technologies that require a wide range of expertise. Device interoperability is a, a major issue. Devices from different manufacturers even the similar devices are implemented with different features or the features are implemented differently so that the apps and users have to interact with them in different ways. Uh, there's uh, security vulnerabilities because of the always connected nature of, the, of these devices. Scalability, both in deployment and maintaining long term. So we saw that Android Things addresses some of these issues by bringing in the Android development uh, framework for, ease, for to leverage the Android ecosystem. The peripheral manager makes the hardware prototyping easier. Weave addresses some of the device interoperability uh, issues, plus provides a secure communication protocol. The device security comes for free with Android, with the, the Android security model and its features like verified boot and secure boot. In addition, uh, Android Things offloads the burden of customizing the OS and maintaining it by employing a deployment model of OS as a service. So in this model, Google will generate all images and maintain all the OS images. They will also sign the images and provide all of the OS updates uh, through OTAs. There is also uh, introduced a, a concept called system on a module, which would incorporate the SOC, the BIOS, PMIC, memory, storage, and networking, so that there's a encapsulated hardware module for you to use, which is well tested with the OS image. Intel or the silicon manufacturers will provide Google with the board support packages. OEMs or the device manufacturers will provide the HAL for the sensors and actuators, and also provide the applications that, they, that provide the differentiation to their device. So this works pretty very well for the low and uh, mid-scale companies because they can focus all their energy into their, uh, what is dif differentiating for their device rather than having to maintain and develop an OS. Google is also going to support the OS train releases long term. They will be supporting multiple OS versions at the same time, and uh, the devices can get security updates for these uh, OSs, whether you choose to stay on the same OS for uh, the lifetime of the version, or you can jump to a different version as well. So the boards, IA-based boards supported on Android things, uh, there are three of them which are 
based on Edison, the Arduino board, the SparkFun blocks, and the mini breakout board. The developers preview 2 also added support for the dual compute module, which is one of our high-end uh, compute module. It also features a GPU, and we have enabled the graphics stack for it as well. The other boards supported are Ras Raspberry Pi and a couple of NXP boards. We have um, uh, some the Intel boards here for you to play with afterwards, and also some of the sensor kits that have been developed for them. So in summary, Android Things makes the development for IoT it simplified and also accelerates it. So you choose a prototype developer board which meets the needs of your product, both cost-wise and technology-wise. And then you can quickly prototype on it by taking advantage of all the tools that Android Things provides. Work with the silicon manufacturers to scale and then deploy the product with all the Google services behind you, including long-term OTAs. I'll now pass it on to Anisha to go over the architecture. Thanks, thanks Geeta. Um, my name is Anisha and I work in the Android Things group. I've been working on Android from the past three years and Android Things for a year now. So I hope I can provide you guys with a good technical overview of Android Things and probably and also compare Android and Android things. I'm going to leave you guys with a few steps on how to get started building applications on Android things. So what does the Android things stack look like? Uh, this is a figure of the Android things stack. And as you can see, it's quite similar to that of Android. You have the Linux kernel, on top of which sits the hardware abstraction layer. And from the OS, you communicate to your hardware through the hardware abstraction layer. So in case you want to enable graphics, you would have to program a graphics HAL to talk to your graphics driver on, on the, uh, on, from the Linux kernel. So in comparison with Brillo, Google has enabled the Java API frameworks, Google services on Android things. What this means is that you are now able to write Android applications for your IoT devices. And the API level that you would be working on is that is 7.0, which means you can write Android applications uh, at end desert for your IoT devices. So also, uh, in addition to the Java API framework, we also and the Google services, Google provides you with a Think support library, which enable uh, uh, Android developers to speak to their hardware, like sensors and actuators, using a peripheral manager. I'll be talking in more detail about the Think support library. So another key difference from, uh, from Android is that OTAs are received directly from Google. Earlier it, in Android, that was not the case. Like the BSP provider would, ha would have control over the, would have to uh, release their own OTAs. So what are a few of the other differences between Android and Android things? Most of us who have worked on Android must have seen this stack before. So what's the what's difference is that Android Things does not come with a set of pre-built system apps. So basically, when you have your Android phone, you have the calendar app or an email app which come by default. And Android Things does not have that. And also, there's no concept of content providers. You, you cannot communicate from one application to another using content providers. And most of the Google APIs, which are supported on Android, are supported on Android things, except for a caveat that all of the APIs which require user authentication have not yet been enabled. This is probably because we're still on developer preview too, and all of the security features have not yet been enabled. So one of the key differences between using an Android phone and using an Android things IoT device is the way that you uh, the, the user experience is. You don't have navigations uh, on the Android Things device to move from one app to another. Android Things introduces a concept called as the home activity, which you use an intent. Basically, an intent is a concept in Android where you can say, this is what I want to do. So you provide an intent saying, I want to use the IoT launcher intent, which means this application would be 
the first app which runs once you boot your device. And, but this, so the whole user experience is meant that is, is a way that only you're interacting with a single application. But uh, you can still run more than one application on your device. Another thing is that you don't have a concept of a Play Store where you could go and download an app. Whatever your device comes with, uh, those are the apps that would be running. You don't download new apps on Android things. So I mentioned about the Think Support Library. So what does an IoT developer want to do? Mainly he wants to be able to write, program sensors and build cool apps using sensors and actuators. And Android Things introduces two types of APIs which enable you to do, the, to do that. These are the peripheral I.O. APIs and the user driver APIs. Basically, what you do with the peripheral I.O. APIs is talk to the Linux SysFS and program uh, through interfaces like GPIO, um, UART, I squared C. One would say I could directly program the Linux SysFS. Uh, why would I have, want to go through Peripheral Manager? This adds a layer of security through SE Linux policies and provides mutual exclusion that in that if a, if a sensor is using uh, a GPIO port already, you, you're not, uh, uh, Peripheral Manager gates you from using that very same port. The other type of APIs are the user driver APIs uh, in which you can actually write a sensor driver um, and have other applications use the driver through these exposed APIs. So one of the key concerns or challenges in IoT devices is, is security. And um, although Android Things is a fairly new OS, it borrows a lot of maturity from Android. So you would basically be running with the same level of security that your Android device which is running and as uh, Nougat would be running. I'm going to walk you guys through a few of the security features that the Android things, uh, Google, basically Google requires Intel to implement. So whatever kernel your Android things device is running has to run with SE Linux enforced. So in addition to the DAC policies which the Linux file system has, you would additionally be enforcing mandatory access policies through SE Linux enforcement. So uh, that covers the kernel level security. In addition, Google introduces two of the key concepts for hardware-backed security. So verified boot is basically uh, a cryptographic chain of trust right from the hardware root of trust up until the system image that guarantees you the integrity of the image that you're running. So basically on first boot, you have the BIOS, which is trusted by IFP keys, the hardware root of trust. The BIOS only boots the bootloader, which it trusts. The bootloader would only boot the boot image or kernel image with it, which it's trusting. And then right up to the system, the OS image, you're, you have this cryptographic chain of trust. Um, also introduced in, in Android is the Google Android Trusty. Trusty OS is basically uh, Android's trusted execution environment. So what is a trusted execution environment? When you're running... When you want to do few secure operations, you would want the main OS not to be able to access these resources. So th this is why you would run uh, it either using a secure processor or a virtualized environment. Google actually provides a reference implementation for Trusty, which is based on ARM and is called TrustZone. But Intel has its own solution for the trusted execution environment. Here's a stack of the of Intel's solution for Trusty. All of the components in blue are the ones which impl are impl implemented by Intel, and uh, all of the components in orange are what Google provides uh, you through the AOSP tree. So as you could see, um, when you run with Trusty OS uh, enabled, both Android OS and Trusty OS run as guest OSs on a secure monitor hypervisor. Google provides you trusty drivers, which, which are added to the Linux kernel in order to talk to trusty OS. So basically, you could start, it's, it's very similar to just starting an IPC and communicating, and trust, uh, Android OS says, uh, passes across messages to trusty OS. 
Also provided uh, by Google are the trusty libraries, uh, uh, which are helpers to various, uh, for the various apps in order to call into trusty. So how is trusty OS given this hardware root of trust? So there's a following sequence of events which happen to pass the trusty root key from the hardware uh, using the CSE. So CSE is a security, uh, consolidated security engine, which basically is, the, is a secure entity which ha which, which, who is the only one who can access this, these IFP keys. Uh, the, the CSE uh, is, is basically firmware in the IAFW, which is the Intel BIOS. The uh, CSE generates a trusty root key and uh, the bootloader passes the, trust, uh, the trusted root key from the CSE to trusty OS. The, the communication from the bootloader to the CSE happens with, by, a, by a protocol called HECI. And once the trusty root, root key is in trusty, it's used by trusty for various other trusted apps. Like Basically, that's the master key from which uh, keys for other apps like key master, gatekeeper, et cetera, are used. So what is an application of the trusted execution environment, and when would you use it? Suppose you have a, like you, a, a very common example is that of DRM keys. You don't want secure content to be, anyone to be able to steal your secure content. So all of the encryption and decryption, uh, the key, basically the DRM keys are stored in trusty, and all of the uh, encryption and decryption happens in trusty. So, uh, all of that data is never stored in the memory of, uh, in the Android memory. Another example where you would use Trusty is for full disk encryption. Uh, with the introduction of uh, the Java API framework, also came the enablement of the graphic stack on, on Android things. So the graphic stack for Android things from the AOSP perspective is exactly the same as that it would be for Android. We, on the Joule module, we have enabled both 2D and 3D apps. So following the same protocol, all of the blocks in blue are those which would be implemented by Intel, and all of the ones in orange are that from Google. So you have your hardware, and we use the i915 driver for, for the kernel and uh, the various HAL components are the libdrm, drm, graloc, and the hardware composer. So the cool thing about this is that the entire graphics stack is open source following Mesa, and uh, there aren't any proprietary uh, binaries being distributed. So now that you guys have an overview of the key features added in Android things, what is it that you could do out there to, to get get started and start playing and writing Android applications. So the first thing you would do is go to this site and download uh, the images based on which device you have. So uh, we have links for these in the end and resources too in, in the resources slide. So on this page, you would also find the uh, uh, images for the other, uh, the, the non-Intel supported platforms like Raspberry Pi or NXP. So once you have downloaded this image and you have a Joule or Edison module, right now I'm using Joule as an example, uh, so you'd, you'd also need the following hardware. You'd need a micro USB cable, a USB type C cable, a power adapter, an HDMI cable, cable and a micro SD card reader. So whatever image that you obtained in this link, you, it, it comes with a, a fastboot image, dot, uh, fastboot disk image. And all of these instructions are actually there on the site. I just thought, I, I mean, I'm walking you guys through it so that it's easier for you guys when, once you do get started doing this. So you flash that image on the micro SD card micro SD card and, and uh, hook it up to, to your Joule device. So before you do that, you would also need to update the BIOS on your uh, device, and there's links for, for that too in the, in the instructions page. 
So once you have the image on uh, the SD card and you have the BIOS updated, the first thing, once you power on your device by connecting the power cable uh, or, and connecting your host to the USB Type-C cable, and you can optionally hook up a USB keyboard in order to interrupt the BIOS. So once you have that, you would uh, enter into fast boot mode. So basically, fast boot mode is, uh, is a requirement for, to be implemented for all Android devices, where you can enter and f basically flash your device. So you would enter fast boot mode and follow these instructions. Uh, all of these images are part of that initial uh, zip file which you guys downloaded. And uh, you can obtain ADB and fast boot from the Android SDK. So what, what do you have uh, once you run this command and run fast boot reboot? You would boot into Android things, and this is how the Android things startup looks like. You can see a cool reflection of the jewel here. So once you have that Hello World experience, you're able to bl uh, bring up your Android Things device. Google provides you with a few code samples which you could use to, to get started and um, basically play around with the device. So my colleague, Sandria, who's in the audience now, is going to be delving deeper into the code. But, but what I'm going to be showing you guys is just like how to flash, uh, build, and install the application and how to actually get, get the app starting. So the Hello World example, which I'm going to use, is very standard to IoT, is like blinking an LED. So uh, this is from Google sample code. It's called uh, Simple PIO, and I'm going to be explaining the, the blink, uh, blink application. What you need for this is Android Studio running at uh, Android API level 7. So you, you, uh, we, have, we have links at the end for uh, the sample code. You'd clone the code and import it to Android Studio. And the hardware that you need is, uh, in addition to the Joule and the cables, which I mentioned earlier, you'd need an LED, a resistor, two jumper wires, and a breadboard. So this is the connection that I've made. Uh, basically, this is ground. And the, uh, this is a GPIO which flows through the register, I mean, which is connected through a resistor to an LED. So once you have the app, uh, this is a sample, so I, you're, you're not going to be making any changes to it. You would basically open Android Studio, press, press run, or if you prefer using the command line, you'd run uh, Gradle W, Blink, install debug. So what this does is it doesn't start your app already. It builds and flashes that app onto your device. Once you run ADB shell AM start and start your activity, your activity is brought to the foreground. And then you could see, see that LED blinking. I hope you guys got a good overview of Android Things and how to get started with Android Things. So basically, an important thing to note is that with this framework, you already have so much experience and so much uh, word in the community about Android applications. So it would be very easy to get started writing Android, Android Things applications. So um, I hope you guys try it out and start playing contribute to the forums. And yep, thanks a lot. Any questions? It would also be for the applications. Then the application has to be in the store, right? So basically, we will pr the BSP who is or the OEM would provide the image back to Google, and they would push it uh, onto the device. So that's the relationship we have right now with with Google. Like we send them our BSP, 
and they push it across. So it will be part of the OEM partition. Yeah, and the OEM. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, the source is open. Yeah, the trust. Trusty OS? Yes. Uh, Linux is T. Um, I'm not sure I get the question. Like, Trusty is a separate domain, right? Yeah, it's. It has its own operating system, right? Yeah, so this is a li little kernel. It's not the Linux kernel, it's a stripped down. Uh, the kernel which trustee uses is called little kernel. Um, how, how different is it from Linux? It's, it's, it's much more lightweight than Linux. Okay. 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 Part two is if I did want to deploy a new application, I could potentially add it to the image, push it to Google, and then I would have, a, let's say, I had two earlier, and I now I can have a third application. Is that correct? We don't know the details of that yet. They have not been disclosed how that's going to work. So uh, for high volume, uh, Google will be open to working directly for the vendors. And there's also a concept of um, having some open source design that you can flatten out onto your design board. But it's basically going to be SOMS. No, you can provide those, that, those as APKs. No, right. So the, if it's, if it's the kernel or the oh, the kernel itself, yeah. It's in the, it's in the system server. Yeah, yeah. Like how uh, it's been working now is that we send updates, uh, uh, whatever changes we have, we upstream it to, their, to them and uh, they push it across. Yeah. So it will be part Sandy of it. Developer, am I going to send it to Intel to send it to Google? So that's going to work for you guys, right? So 
Yeah. yeah. So, so the, it, there has to be a direct way that a, a developer who uses the BSP from Intel, which went to Google and got signed, which there needs to be, it has to be some flavor of an app store, maybe not the ability to download on Bill, but the provisioning has to be very similar to what happens on Android. Anyway, you should have clarity on this and then maybe publish a white paper or something. Yeah. Because it's going to come up over and over again. They haven't done any work on it yet. Yeah. Yeah. All of this is still in a developer preview state, and in fact, on Android things, OTAs have not even not yet been enabled. Yeah. There's no OTAs. There's no weaves. So it's right now. It's in a very nascent stage. The good part about it is they have promised they release every six to eight weeks, so yeah, the so. release is coming to the past. It will be a good time to get involved. Yeah, there are this. Uh, you can have discussions on the Stack Overflow or the Google Forum. So if, if, if I understood correctly, Android Things is not for constrained devices. Is that correct? The Weave is, but yeah, Android Things itself will not run on MCUs. It will run only on MPUs. Yes. But the Weave uh, library you can put on a device, and then it will become a Weave device. But the Weave is not, it's not, is it a microkernel? Is it an independent? It's implemented as a library, so a set of APIs. Can you repeat? This? Yeah, you can run it on any OS. Any, yeah, yeah. It's supposed so I can to be. Use the fire and then put V on that. Is that correct? Use it as what? Zephyr. 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 Oh. I'm not but, sure. Yeah, but they say that Weave is supposed to be OS agnostic. Weave also is the full version is not there. That's also just been yeah. announced, but. Yeah, there's. There's a small library which implements the device APIs, but the rest of it is not there yet. Yeah. What they were doing before was very low, since you mentioned yeah. it, was that they get the uh, microwave components uh -huh. on the other side and then for devices was a fully fledged data metal operating system that they would be storing on from the yeah. and would implement the big process. That's why that was asked yeah. the question. Yeah, that's changed. So if you go to the v, there is a Weave uh, website. If you go there, it tells you more details. Right now, there's just one library, which is called LibIoTA. Okay. Yeah. You, you mentioned some other platforms other than Android Things. Uh, what other platforms are there? The Raspberry Pi and NXP Pico and uh, Argon. Argon and Pico Argon, both. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, it's not. It's not open source. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.